bright red. The teenage boy was on his knees, but in George Square no prayers were being answered. Did his collarbone hurt more than his side? He had never felt such pain. Coshed by a constable who had clearly wished to shatter his shoulder, the lad had no sooner collapsed than a passing sergeant kicked him in the kidneys, the way a keeper would clear his goal two down in an old firm game. No Rangers Celtic Cup final had ever been as noisy as this. It was a pitched battle. Blood was being shed and curdled as if at any moment Bruce or Wallace might appear. Trying to get to his feet, it seemed the small of his back ached more than his neck. That adjudication was curtailed before his full feeble legs could bear his weight. Struck from behind, the sound of his skull cracking was the last thing Dermot Flynn heard until he realised that a comrade must have dragged him to a bench on the edge of the ructions. After a few befuddled seconds, the protesters now routed and in retreat, oblivion was welcome. Mr Flynn? Mr Flynn? Damn it! At five to ten in the midweek morning, George Square was tranquil, his slumbers unperturbed. She was about to raise her voice and try again, when all of a sudden, with a slight snort, he was fully alert and upright on the bench, a flummoxed frown giving way to an amiable smile. Hello, Mr Flynn, it's Verity. An actor's pause. Verity? Is that the truth? Twinkly eyes she was used to, but a twinkly voice. Of course, from the BBC, why would I lie? Two beats, again, perfectly timed. The teasing smile. Oh, God, I get it. Sorry. Yes, verity. Truly. Nomen est omen, as the Romans used to say. Name is destiny. It was the morning after May Day 1979, with a general election looming that would determine working class fates for generations to come. A portentous day to be commemorating the Battle of George Square. The old man rose and made a gallant little bow, extending a delicate hand. Not tall, but pleasantly proportioned, and natally turned out in a cream linen jacket and navy slacks, vermilion knitted tie. All this she took her time taking in. He noticed her, noticing. My apologies. It's a bit warm for a boiler suit and bonnet, and the moth's got my muffler. She laughed, seeing now the silk paisley handkerchief in his breast pocket. This is radio, so the listeners can pick their own props and costume. A top hat and cigar? Probably not, she agreed. Gesturing towards the bench, she laughed invitingly. Please. Not television, then, Verity. Oh, and do call me Derry. She squirmed in her seat, almost imperceptibly. No, only radio, I'm afraid. And even that's not guaranteed. Busy times, politically. Depressing and distressing in every way. Flynn's sigh could have won the Oscar for best supporting understatement. So I'm being auditioned. You're being consulted. You utter bastard, Nick, she thought to herself. One wine woozy bonk on the departmental habit away day, whose only consequence was excruciating social and professional awkwardness, and her lecherous twerp of a boss was attempting to manage her out the door. For they have to have moved. He would have had to hire a bulldozer. No matter. Blue eyes and a few strands of auburn in his full head and neatly cropped grey hair. It's a bonny day and always touching to be back in George Square. 
That's very gracious of you, Derry, she said, removing a spiral notebook from her satchel. Nick had set this and her up via Tamsin, the new trainee whom he was strenuously mentoring whenever his wife and kids were at their cottage in the Cotswolds. Tamsin had refused to waste precious CV burnishing time on a Scottish commie coffin dodger. She was in Islington battling a fictitious cold. Nick had phoned Dermot but not Verity and was now out of the office and unavailable. Doubtless prescribing that Tamsin remain bedridden too. He had passed on no details of his cursory call to Dermot Flynn. Verity had been in Edinburgh preparing a feature on Thatcher and the Union. Nick had left a three-sentence message at her hotel. A colleague in the BBC library had put the brief in briefing before taking a more important call. The rigged referendum on devolution had not brought out for yes the requisite 40% of those eligible to vote. That calamitous and recent reverse on the 1st of March had closed the door on home rule while opening the gates to Thatcher. Today was May the 2nd, a Wednesday. On Friday, a Tory government seemed certain to be elected. Verity shuddered, gathered herself. All set. Her BBC pen was poised. You're not recording. Next time, if the pitch is commissioned. Derry was easy to offend, but hard to hurt. Now remember... To tell a story, you have to sell a story. Okay. Really? As an engineer, I was forced to sell my labour, but I've been retired a long time. There's nothing I'm obliged to sell. Verity hadn't blushed since Beedales, but her cheeks pinkened somewhat. Quite. My apologies. A glibly chosen word. But my producer, Nick, said you were rather the raconteur. The blatant fib produced a flush, if not a blush. Really? Verity. I've had longer calls from the speaking clock. Fucking Nick. How she wished she hadn't been. Mr. Flynn Derry, I'm mortified. Please forgive me. Nothing to forgive. His lightly contoured lilt was as resonantly expressive as a professional actor's. She had worked with announcers whose timbre was not as sonorous as this Clydeside shop steward's mellifluous bar. We can begin. An assenting nod. Gravitas in his countenance and comportment. How many people died? Nobody died. And the tank? There was no tank. Did the soldiers fix bayonets? The army didn't arrive until the next day. Deployed from England for fear of mutiny? Mostly, but squaddies dispatched from Aberdeen obeyed orders and patrolled the streets. Which striker landed a punch on the police chief's jaw? That was Willie Gallagher, but his fist didn't connect. A bit of a romancer, Willie. Mind you, revolutions need their myths. A sales pitch, this wasn't. Fiery speeches by James McLean and John Maxton. John McLean and James Maxton. No, prison had broken McLean. He was away touring the Durham coalfield. Maxton was out of town too. But the ideological underpinning, the efforts to establish workers' councils and a Soviet to emulate the contemporaneous Spartacist uprising in Berlin, the revolution being fomented here on Red Clydeside. Clydeside was as red as a foundry girder, but there was no Marxist manifesto. There could and should have been. In 1916, Connolly imposed a theoretical template on a half arse nationalist insurgency, but we failed to see, far less seize, the revolutionary moment here. We weren't Leninists, merely exploited workers, demanding our due. His downward glance acknowledged her disappointment. There was a police cavalry charge, if that helps. Brava, Tamsin, you cow, brava. Artfully dodged, 
So it's no story here. A scuffle, a fracas, a skirmish, a melee. It's hardly the storming of the Winter Palace. Derry Flynn watched her doubts file past like a general inspecting a parade. 22 outfitted from a box in the BBC wardrobe department with radio researcher stenciled on the lid. Serious without seeming solemn, rigorous yet playful, ruefully ruthless, ambitious but likeable with it. Those scarlet ethnic beads were heading for the top. Do you drink coffee, Ms? Pemberton, I should have said. One barrel. I'd been hoping for a hyphen. I should have offered you a coffee when we met, Mr. Flynn. Remiss and rude. The North British Railway Hotel is over there, on the left. That twinkly smile. Things are always better on the left, Miss Pemberton. After you. <laughs>